started. Thank you everyone for joining us. Welcome to the latest Duke media briefing on the aftermath of the 2020 election. I'm Greg Phillips with Duke Communications. We have four Duke scholars with us today, experts in election security, terrorism, national defense and misinformation to discuss the storming of the US Capitol building on Wednesday, and what it means for the transition of power in this country and the future of American democracy. I'll introduce our speakers and get the discussion started, then we'll open it up to questions. With us today is Judith Kelly. She is Dean of the Sanford School of Public Policy at Duke, where she is also a senior fellow with the Keenan Institute for Ethics. Her areas of research include human rights, democracy, and international election observation. Good morning to you. And we have Peter Fever. He directs the Duke Program in American Grand Strategy. He was a special advisor for strategic planning and institutional reform on the National Security Council staff in the George W. Bush administration, and was director of defense policy and arms control in the Clinton administration. Good morning. Also joining us is Phil Napoli. He is a professor of public policy at Sanford and a faculty member at the DeWitt Wallace Center, where he researches new ideas for social media regulation, local news deserts, and the contraction of news media. Good morning, Professor Napoli. And we have David Shanza. He is a professor of the practice at the Sanford School and director of the Triangle Center on Terrorism and Homeland Security. He was the De Democratic Staff Director for the House of Representatives Committee on Homeland Security from 2003 to 2005 and worked on the staffs of several US senators, including President-elect Joe Biden. Good morning to all of our panelists. We're gonna go ahead and get started. And Professor Shanza, I'd like to start with you. Um, yesterday's events and the people involved in them have de been described lots of different ways. But what does yesterday say about the level of domestic terrorism in the United States currently? Well, this was uh, this is a domestic terrorist movement. Uh, I'm afraid it's gotten to that point. Uh, terrorism experts have been warning about the rise in white right wing extremism uh, inside the United States uh, for over a decade. And it has been growing substantially during the Trump administration, yet really only small numbers of individuals had been mobilized to violence. And, uh, uh, but what we saw yesterday was showed the, uh, really a mass, massive amount of people driven towards violence. And that's really having taken this movement to uh, a, a new level. Uh, that is, you know, uh, deeply disturbing and, and will have to be addressed. Thank you very much. We've certainly got more to talk about there, and I'm going to come back to that. But for a moment, Professor Fever, I'm going to move on to you. Uh, the police presence was clearly inadequate yesterday. Military leaders had already expressed reluctance to be involved ahead of whatever they thought might happen yesterday. But what are the factors there, and how should we assess the role of the military in what happened and over the next two weeks? Well, for the last six months, uh, there's been a lot of speculation of would the would President Trump be unwilling to step down if he uh, lost the election? And if would he use his powers as commander in chief to try to create some kind of uh, chaos that would allow him to stay on in power? And so there was a lot of attention devoted to that. And the military has been crystal clear in messaging for the last six months that, no, there just is no a uh, role for the military in the peaceful transfer of political power. They don't have a role in it under the constitution and they will only obey uh, legal orders. Moreover, uh, as they uh, experienced in the, the uh, dis disturbances of last May and June, uh, when you mobilize the military in response to domestic uh, violence and, and the, a breakdown in law and order, uh, it can itself, just the mobilization of the military introduces all sorts of other complications. And they did not like uh, getting mobilized in response uh, to the riots in the end of May and early June, and, and uh, indeed uh, tried very hard to persuade President Trump not to uh, mobilize even more forces. As a consequence, they were leaning very, very far in one direction on the horse uh, to avoid falling in over where they did in May and June, and they may have uh, been a little bit too slow to respond when the threat that emerged was something very different. It was not a threat of violence that the president was seizing on to mobilize the military to do something else. This was violence bought that the president himself was inciting, conducted by his own supporters, and that was putting at risk uh, the uh, members of Congress uh, and the constitutional process that was taking place that day. Uh, it took them a little while to respond, but then they eventually did and order was restored. And I think that uh, in the long run, uh, 
that while there's certainly lessons to be learned and an after action review has to be taken, in the long run, we can be grateful that the military uh, did what we want them to do and did not do what we didn't want them to do. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Um, Dean Kelly, I'd like to move on to you. Professor Fever mentioned about how the, you know, the business of democracy resumed last night, and that was, of course, very important. But by then, we had all these indelible images of smash windows and rioters in the halls of power. What does that mean for American, American democracy in this moment, how it's perceived around the world, and, 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 and what are the implications, do you think, moving forward? Well, that's a lot of questions, but I think Churchill was the one who said that, you know, democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the other ones. And, and one, of the, one of the features of democracy is that it is inherently a volatile institution in the sense that it has to be able to be challenged. And if it wasn't able, if we don't have ways for democracy to be challenged, then it actually would ironically be more uh, susceptible to abuses of power, but what we've also really had to display in the last couple of months is just how much the rules and the procedures that underlie democracy are supported by norms, shared norms about behaviors. And what we saw yesterday certainly was a breach of both the rules and of the norms in, in our society. And I would say that, uh, you know, um, the test of a democracy, if we think about how a democracy has fared so far, the test of a democracy is not whether it gets tested. It will get tested, uh, but it's how it withstands that test. And the United States has for a long time portrayed itself sort of a shining beacon on the hill. And, and yesterday, uh, some very strong winds blew through the halls of the Capitol and the shining lights flickered but they have, they have stayed on. We have a lot of work to do in thinking about how we keep them on and ways that we can improve our uh, processes and institutions and ways that we can uh, re uh, reinforce the, the shared norms and trust in our society. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, no, go ahead, if you had a point to finish. Well, you, you, you mentioned too about our reputation around the world, you know, you know for, for decades we have been admonishing governments around the world about how to run a true democracy and, you know, it, it's really uh, something to see some of those very governments uh, laughing at us now. And, uh, you know, it, it really goes, uh, points out to the, the value of us understanding our history uh, our public policies, and that we have we have work to do right here in in America. Absolutely, thank you, Dean Kelly, Professor Napoli. I'd like to move on to you. Um, we've seen uh, social media platforms temporarily suspended President Trump last night, and Facebook announced this morning that he's blocked for the remainder of his term. I mean, we all know that social media and partisan websites masquerading as news outlets have spread misinformation that's fueled what we're seeing now. Do you think that the events of yesterday and how some platforms have already reacted? means society might actually start seriously addressing the misinformation? Uh, or is it naive to think there won't be a doubling down once uh, President Biden takes office? Um, I hate to reveal myself as, as more pessimistic, but um, you know, there's as many successes for those who are uh, disseminating disinformation being exhibited in what's happened in just the past couple of days as there might be uh, impediments uh, when we think about the kinds of things that Facebook is doing now, uh, that Twitter is doing. Um, you know, these platforms, there's nothing that changes in terms of how these platforms operate at a scale that makes even their most aggressive efforts, um, you know, far from fully effective. So that's, you know, that's a reality. The other reality is, and we were seeing this um, play it out over the past few days, is it's it's far more than just a social media problem. Uh, it's a problem with our actual elected officials being direct disseminators of uh, disinformation and our traditional media outlets, our cable news outlets, our Fox News is, for example, um, amplifying blatant disinformation. So it's, it's a very complex ecosystem. Uh, and we, you know, the tools we have to deal with it vary by technology. Uh, and that's just the way our regulatory apparatus has been set up. Um, but I would certainly like to think that this is a moment uh, that finally catalyzes a, a, a much more robust conversation about um, both regulatory and 
you know, self-regulatory efforts to um, to police disinformation on on all of our various media platforms. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, and thanks to all of our panelists for those opening comments. Uh, we're going to open it up to questions now. If you have a question, you can type it into the Q&A window or you can raise your hand in Zoom and we can unmute you so you can ask your question directly. Uh, if you're joining by phone, you can unmute yourself or you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. Uh, we've had some questions submitted in advance. Thank you for those. And we're going to run through some of that now. Uh, Professor Shanzo, I'd like to come back to you. You talked about the growing threat of, um, of, of domestic terrorism and white supremacy in this country. Uh, with a President Biden taking office, certainly for the last four years, we've seen at best a blind eye turn to these things and, and certainly outright encouragement of it in some places. Do you expect that the, um, the, the introduction of a Biden presidency will bring a renewed focus to cracking down on that? Um, or do you think that because of the various racial issues at play that it's still not going to be taken as seriously as maybe it should? Well, I think after yesterday, there's uh, no question that this will need to be taken uh, more seriously. Uh, the, I, I certainly believe that the elements like the FBI have uh, had their eye on these groups and individuals uh, who were uh, advocating or fomenting violence during the Trump administration, but uh, a new administration uh, can bring more resources, focus, and direction uh, from the White House uh, to identifying this as a, as a serious national problem. And I don't think you can have uh, witnessed what happened yesterday and not come to the conclusion that uh, you know, large-scale uh, people armed and willing to engage in, in, in large-scale violence uh, and the protests uh, that many which turn violent and are still happening in state capitals, uh, combined with the attempted kidnapping of the governor of, of Michigan, um, uh, armed uh, incursions into state capitals uh, regarding uh, uh, opposition to the pandemic. All of these things demonstrate that this is a, a deeper, more societal problem that's gonna take you know, focused attention uh, by law enforcement uh, in order to uh, dismantle. Of course, you know, the ideological debate and the groups, of course, have the right to mobilize and to advocate uh, and so on. It's the violence uh, that law enforcement uh, needs to focus on. Certainly, thank you. Um, and related to that, uh, Professor Fever, the country is still at a very delicate moment. We have just shy of two weeks until um, the president-elect Biden is supposed to take office. And certainly nobody expected what happened yesterday. And it seems like the country is on something of a knife edge, wondering what's going to happen in the next two weeks. Do you, um, what do you expect to see? Or do you, do you think that military leaders are going to be brought under any kind of pressure from either side, whether from President Trump or from uh, people who are, uh, are opposed to him, to be involved in any kind of con continued unrest that takes place? What kind of um, narrative militarily do you think could potentially unfold in the next two weeks? Is there anything in particular you're watching for? I think our military leaders are, are focused on three things. First and foremost, they're, fo they're focused on the external threat, ad adversaries who might want to take advantage of America's uh, weakness or uh, disorientation or distraction to do harm to us in, in some way. Uh, and the military is primarily outwardly focused and with a deterrent posture to deter uh, adversaries from doing that. And they are going to be uh, very much focused on that over the next two weeks. A couple of days ago was the anniversary of the strike on Suleimani a, a year ago. Uh, the Quds Force leader from Iran and many, many people thought there was a risk of Iran retaliating sometime around the, that anniversary, that risk is still out there. And there's many other things uh, in that domain that could go wrong. The military is focused on that. Secondly, they're focused on the transition uh, because all of the things that they, they worry about uh, will still be concerns on the 21st of January. And uh, the, the Department of Defense and the intelligence community and the rest of the, and the State Department, the national security apparatus is preparing to serve a new president. Uh, but that preparation has been hobbled by the very unusual transition we've had and also by decisions by the Trump administration to delay and to 
um, frustrate the transition. And this has made the work of the national security establishment that much harder. So they're very focused on those kinds of questions to get ready for a handoff. And then thirdly, it's the kind of thing that happened yesterday. Will there be uh, follow on um, actions? There was some flurry of protests in other state capitals. You, if you look at the chatter, you can see Proud Boys and the other kinds of uh, groups that uh, David Chancer was referencing that they're saying things and bragging about what they may or may not do. Uh, the, it, if what they do overwhelms local law enforcement, then there might be a role for the National Guard there as well. And so the, the military is uh, is also watching that. But across those three domains, that's a that's a lot to uh, uh, to be concerned with in ordinary times, and we are very clearly not in ordinary times right now. Right. Could perhaps I the most, perhaps, let me just say, perhaps the most concerning aspect from the military point of view is that uh, the commander in chief himself seems to be AWOL. Uh, if you look at any one of those issues, uh, the commander in chief could set the tone, right? If it's foreign adversary oriented, a, a, a capable and watchful commander in chief would help set the tone. If it's Preparing for transition, the commander in chief sets the tone. The most successful transition we've had in 2008 was led by the outgoing Bush administration, when the president on down focused on helping uh, then incoming President Obama as best they could. They, the president sets the tone. And of course, in terms of the domestic unrest, the president is setting the tone, but he's setting a bad tone. And so, from the military point of view, the commander in chief is AWOL, and that is troubling. Sure. Greg, Professor Shanza, you had something? Yeah, please. I do want it. to ask uh, Peter a quick question on this point. Uh, yesterday, it appears uh, from the public statements that it was the vice president who uh, was involved in the decision to mobilize the DC uh, National Guard. And I'm wondering if you saw that as a potential breach uh, in the chain of command. I'm not aware of the vice president having any formal authorities in that regard. Uh, right. The vice president is not in the chain of command, at least not while the uh, president is uh, active and, um, uh, you know, as compass mentis is not. Uh, provisions of Article uh, Amendment 25 haven't been um, uh, implemented. But the Secretary of Defense is in the chain of command. And I've been trying to find out, we should ask Charlie Dunlap, our colleague at, from the law school, uh, but I've been trying to nail down just how much delegated authority does the Secretary of Defense have to uh, mobilize National Guard units as was done yesterday. And it is my belief, uh, but I can't confirm this uh, on my own authority, but it's my belief that the Secretary of Defense does have that delegated authority because the Secretary of Defense can, can move units around in preparation for, in anticipation of the Commander in Chief the president making a later decision. He can do that globally. And I think with respect to the DC National Guard, he and the Secretary of Army can also do that. So what they were doing, they were consulting with the vice president, but they were acting on delegated authority that had come from them previously uh, through the, the regular chain of command. But you're right, at, at the optics level, it does suggest that, that um, at least some of the president's national security team was deciding they had to act uh, while he was not acting, while President Trump was choosing not to intervene. And, and I in the days to come, we're gonna get very detailed TikToks of what happened when, who talked to when, and that will be certainly one of the, the aspects that I'll be looking very closely to understand. Thank you both for that. Um, Dean Kelly, I'd like to move on to you. Um, you mentioned uh, the shining light uh, and we had a, a question related to, to this, and particularly how uh, the U.S. has been perceived in Latin America. And we had a reporter ask, how, what can the Biden administration do to recover any credibility that's lost yesterday? And I'm thinking that feeds into what you were talking about with norms and the norms that support our volatile democracy. Is there anything that can be done, do you think? Thank you. Um I do think uh, there is something that can be done. I think that it's actually something that can be done in a very bipartisan way. Uh, you know, some of the uh, requests that have been made 
uh, from the Republican side has been for uh, a, a, a commission or a body that would look at our elections more broadly. And, you know, going back even to after the 2000 election in Florida, that was uh, problematic. There was a, uh, a uh, commission on federal election reform that was established back then in 2004 that ended up you know, it was um, chaired by Jimmy Carter and and, um, and 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 Baker, and ended up making over 80 different recommendations about what could be done. And I think this kind of bipartisan effort to come together and look again uh, at the many recommendations that have already been made by previous bodies, by international election monitors, and that we ourselves now in this moment, having learned from this past year, uh, what are some changes we can make to our electoral systems uh, and, uh, you know, to, to um, to think about how the, the process can be more uniform uh, across states to make sure that when somebody, somebody's ballot gets counted, uh, if it arrives by a certain time in one state, you know, does it apply the same way in other states uh, to look at um, you know, when you, we can start counting? Can we get some uniformity on that across the states? How, how do district lines get drawn, et cetera, even questions about the electoral college, et cetera, et cetera. So many recommendations are already out there. And I think that President Biden uh, should form a, a task force or commission of some sort uh, to, to make sure, because it is problematic. Uh, regardless of what the reason is, it is problematic now that so many Americans if you, if you do the math, if it's something like 75% of, of, of Republican voters or something like this, we're talking about 50 million people or something like that, believe that these elections were not to be trusted. And, and that is a, 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 um, a problem that will carry over. That kind of mistrust is the norms that we need for society to function. So we need to find ways to restore faith in these processes in a bipartisan way. Thank you very much, Dean Kelly. Professor Napoli, I'd like to come back can to I just you. Add, can, I, can I just add something Please. to that to reinforce what uh, Dean Kelly just said? Um, before Christmas, I published a, a call that the, I said Biden should get out in front of, of, of this issue by calling for a national commission, which would take a year or two to, uh, to investigate. Uh, it might turn up that you know there were anomalies in some areas. Some you know there there in a vote as large as uh, the United States, there's bound to be mistakes that were made and maybe even isolated cases of outright fraud. So it's not as if they couldn't find not anything. But what they would do is what all the previous commissions did, which is make incremental improvements to keep pace with changing demography, changing technology, et cetera and it will provide an exit ramp for Republican leaders. That's what they clearly needed. Now, the violence yesterday provided sort of an emergency exit ramp, and you saw a number of Republicans who up until yesterday had been, um, you know, sort of quietly abetting Trump, but then come out publicly and say, enough is enough. I'm thinking of Senator Graham, Lindsey Graham, uh, most prominently yesterday. But I think with something like that commission earlier, you would have seen more people leaving earlier, more Republican leaders leaving earlier, and that would have created a brighter division between the really extreme wing that was sticking with Trump and gonna go down with the ship and the Republicans who are saying, okay, we now have to get ready to work, to work under a, a Biden administration and uh, we'll look to improve uh, how best we can. It was a missed opportunity, but it's now, uh, I'd, I'd say, even more important. Thank you. Uh, thank you both for weighing in on that. Uh, Professor Napoli, I'd, I'd like to come back to you. You mentioned earlier briefly, um, you know, there was this narrative yesterday that it was there were Antifa activists who were involved in storming the Capitol to make it look worse than it was. And this has been debunked. But of course, it appears, especially you know, in the, in the minds of many people that believe the election was stolen, that there is no such thing as debunking, because any debunking is just seen as part of an ongoing fake news effort to discredit whatever information they have. How do we begin to tackle um, such complete and utter distrust in, in even fact checking and backing up the news? Is there a way to turn that ship around? Well, that's a great question. And that's a tough question. Um, and I think the important thing as we approach it is to recognize that we have to begin with the actual uh, news consumers. It's, 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 it's easy to frame this as a Facebook problem or a YouTube problem. Um, but the reality is the average person doing 
even just the uh, minimal amount of work um, can pretty much determine for themselves what is legitimate uh, and what is illegitimate. Uh, and so the reality is for, for most of these folks who we you know, make the mistake of just sort of labeling them uh, helpless victims of, of disinformation, um, you know, there are deeper problems with them as citizens, as news consumers, et cetera, uh, that need to be addressed. Uh, and so it really, you know, it's almost a generational uh, strategy we need to take. We need to recognize that what we need to do is make sure the next generation of citizens, the next generation of voters uh, has a set of skill sets, uh, has, you know, um, you know, particular norms about how they go about informing themselves about how they make decisions that, you know, current generations perhaps do not have. Um, you hear a lot of talk about media literacy uh, and, and how that's something that's missing. Um, and, you know, we see that in the ways that the elderly in particular have proven so susceptible uh, to disinformation uh, on various platforms. Um, so it's, it's, it's not just these platforms becoming more um, rigorous in, in preventing, and that's an important thing. Uh, I think finally, um, you know, their norms are changing. These, these notions of we're going to flag this content, we're gonna put a label on it. Um, you know, those were silly to begin with. They're even seem more silly now. Um, and if, if these platforms don't operate under the logic of that we are not all entitled to, to the right to uh, disseminate whatever's on our mind on social media. The sooner we get to that as the understood norm, uh, the better. Uh, but we also need to be training uh, our students to be um, better news consumers than, than, than the average adult is today. Sure, thank you. I mean, do you think that um, there's a multi-pronged approach needed there in the sense that maybe social media platforms could, before people could set up accounts, have them go through a training on how to spot this stuff? Or is it simply that if we look at, you know, whether it's the pandemic or politics, misinformation infects everything. So even at the, at the, uh, the school, public school level, people need to, when we're teaching kids how to use computers, we need to teach them this stuff since it's, it's become part of what it means to be a citizen. I mean, is that something you envision happening in the future? Yeah, and you said the, the, the key word, which is multi-pronged. Um, the other key prong to mention there is we need to do a lot more to reinvigorate our traditional mainstream journalism sector, which ironically these platforms, you know, the, the platforms are doing damage on, on uh, you know, both ends of the equation. On the one hand, they are becoming these massive mechanisms for disseminating disinformation. On the other hand, they are also sucking the economic uh, engine right out of traditional journalism. Uh, and so there's less of the kind of journalism we need uh, to operate and combat the kind of journalism we don't need. Um, so that's, that's another key component of really rebuilding our um, you know, mainstream news ecosystem that suffered incredible damage. We set a record, I saw the number, I'm gonna forget it uh, now, but we set a record this year, this past year, in terms of the number of journalism jobs that disappeared in this country. Ultimately, Absolutely. Greg, I, I think one of the things we need to do, and I think Mitt Romney is really the one who hit on it directly yesterday, is that our national leaders need to tell the truth and that there needs to be a accountability, some way of uh, uh, having political accountability against those who disseminate falsehoods. And I disagree a little bit with my panelists about the idea that we need a, a commission uh, on this particular election. Um, the election by all accounts was the most secure in American history, and it was the most well vetted uh, both before and after the election uh, by the American court system. Uh, and so what we need is our national leaders uh, to tell the truth, we need to end what's been a four to five year period of massive lying from the, uh, the, the executive branch, from the, from the president. Uh, and, many, and then we need to have a culture in the country that punishes uh, the, the intentional telling of falsehoods. Now, is that going to stop misinformation from spreading on the platforms as uh, Phil noted? No, uh, but, you know, especially when it comes to, to terrorism, uh, it's the 
charismatic leadership uh, telling falsehoods and lies and distorting uh, what America is, what our system is, and, 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 and who has opportunity and who does not, and so on, that are, create the magnification of the grievances that is leading to this uh, horrible you know, erosion of our social fabric. And so I think we need to have a very candid discussion about how, uh, what it, what, how to uh, re-inculcate truth-telling into our political ecosystem. Can I just follow up on that too? It's, you know, I think tied into that as part of the solution to that is addressing this issue of the extreme polarization, obviously, that we have in this country right now. If you talk to people who are on the on either of the extremes, what you quickly realize is they are that that that, that they see the they, the other side has been demonized to such an extent that they truly, genuinely believe um, that the means justify the ends. That folks who are engaged in flagrant lying uh, feel they are doing so, you know. For a good cause, and I don't know how we correct that, but that's a that's 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 a you know, and that and that affects our our politicians as much as it affects our um, you know us at the at the citizen level. Absolutely, Dean Kelly. I just think I was just going to add that um, um, on, on the commission, I was not actually necessarily suggesting that it should be uh, an investigation into this particular election, but rather that it should be a general uh, perspective on how we run our elections. But I would say to uh, also to the point about truth telling um, and, and consequences that as tragic as the events of yesterday were, uh, they did lay bare the consequences of what happens when politicians don't tell the truth and when they stoke fear and hatred. And in some ways, we all got to see the belly of the beast. And even Lindsey Graham, when he saw the belly of the beast said, count me out, right? And I think that hopefully the effect of what happened yesterday is that fewer people will think that a strategy, a political strategy of stoking fear and hatred is a safe enough strategy to play. We have been playing with fire. And if we play with fire and the house doesn't catch on fire, the practice of playing with fire will spread. Yesterday, the house caught fire. Uh, hopefully we will learn the lessons from that. Well, Dean Kelly, based on you know, your experience of um, uh, monitoring elections in other maybe that what used to be considered less mature democracies, the, when you look at other countries, does that give you um, additional hope that this kind of inflection point that the US has reached, that, that there are people who have maybe been egging it on who will now step back from the brink, whether it's elected leaders or people in the ballot box? I mean, do these kind of incidents, do they have a history in other countries of maybe kind of prompting countries to actually strengthen their systems rather than like falling into the abyss? I, I don't, a, a parallel does not come to mind for me because what we've seen in the United States has been so inverse of what we normally see. You know, normally you have an incumbent who is setting up an election to cheat and refuses to step down after claiming that the election was indeed free and fair. And, and so, you know, everything seems so upside down in this context. It's odd to, to, to try to draw some parallels um, to, um, uh, to that. So I think, uh, I think the hope that we have is to look to our own citizens, to look to our own politicians. I think we saw in the chamber yesterday, many politicians, including many Republicans, um, already starting to draw some of those lessons. So I am hopeful from, from that perspective. Well, I certainly think we all need some hope right now. Um, <laughs> Professor Fever, I'd like to come back to you. There is um, a large elephant in the room of this briefing that several people have asked about, and that is the likelihood that the 25th Amendment could be invoked between now and when Trump is scheduled to leave office. Could you um, tell us, and I, I certainly want to get everybody else's perspective on this if you'd like to weigh in, first of all, what that would actually involve um, in order for that to, to take place, and then whether you think that it's likely or how it could unfold. Right, so the 25th Amendment deals with the succession, uh, uh, what to do with an in incapacitated or vacancy uh, in the 
the president or the vi vice presidency. Uh, and so some of it is, is just sort of ordinary fixes uh, that uh, if, um, if the vice president leaves, then uh, the president can appoint the successor as when Spiro Agnew left and uh, um, the uh, Nixon appointed Ford. So they didn't have to wait to another election before you got a, a vice president. Uh, there's also provisions for if the president's gonna, you know, is medically incapacitated or gonna go undergo a medical procedure and, you know, go under general anesthesia or something like that, then you need an acting president for the time period when uh, he or she eventually she is uh, out of commission, as it were. Uh, president Bush did that and a number of presidents have um, had to have that portion uh, enacted in order to, uh, to make sure that we always have a functioning president uh, in the job. The controversial part is uh, when the president doesn't want to, have, to hand over powers, can other people make him hand over powers? And there are, the 25th Amendment provides two ways of doing that. One is if the majority of the cabinet with the vice president in agreement, uh, conclude that the president is not ca capable of doing the job. And it's, uh, it's a little bit vague uh, as to what are the, uh, the criteria for them determining that. But if they do determine that, then uh, they, um, the 25th Amendment is, uh, comes into force. Or if Congress creates some sort of body to investigate and they, along with the vice president, do it. Uh, it's technically possible, it's never been done. Uh, and with only two weeks to go, it's unlikely that it would, would happen. But um, I will note that while uh, just you know, a few minutes ago, I believe, or an hour ago or something, Senator Schumer, the, the now leader of the, the Senate, majority leader of the Senate, uh, called for it to be uh, enacted. And so um, technically it's possible uh, and of course, we've never had a day like yesterday, certainly not since the 25th Amendment. And uh, the, re the reporting out of the White House suggests that President Trump is um, very, very uh, disturbed by all that's going on and, you know, and could be said to be in a fashion uh, where he's un incapable of performing his job. Um, and so you could imagine, and that's why there's so much speculation about it, you could imagine uh, it being contemplated. We know from reports that lower level people, not necessarily cabinet level who would have the, the power, but their staffs have been discussing it. Uh, but with just two weeks to go, it's, it's unlikely that it would happen. But of course, if we were meeting 48 hours ago, we would have said yesterday was unlikely to happen too. So we're in a time when unlikely things have been happening. We certainly are. Uh, and on that topic, Professor Shanzer, I'd like to come back to you. Um, you, you study domestic terrorism here in the US a lot. Um, and to ask you to, to gaze at the crystal ball for a moment, I mean, do you expect that over the next two weeks, the remaining days of the Trump presidency, that it's possible people will be emboldened by what happened yesterday or just see that as, as what they needed to do? I mean, do you expect that that, that could be a, a touch paper that makes the situation worse or have we just reached a peak and do you expect things to quieten down? And I realize that's uh, asking you to predict a lot. Yeah, let me first uh, just talk about the 25th uh, Amendment uh, issue. Uh, the Constitution provides two safety valves. One is impeachment uh, and, and one is the 25th Amendment. The 25th Amendment is about really more incapacity. Uh, impeachment is about uh, essentially a corruption and uh, the a failure to, uh, and, and, and a, a corruption that is a, a threat to the, to the country uh, by the president and a check on his uh, ultimate power. And I think in both instances, uh, the, these thresholds uh, have been reached. I think uh, by the phone call uh, to the Secretary of State uh, the other day of Georgia, uh, where the president is essentially calling on him to uh, take uh, unlawful action to reverse the, the electoral results in a state is a, is a form of political corruption that uh, we have not seen and we have tapes, so we have proof uh, of that in this country that is really uh, almost as akin to the what caused the Ukraine uh, corruption in inquiry. Uh, 
But the incapacity question is even more important. We're talking about an individual who has uh, control uh, with a lot of checks uh, of, of nuclear weaponry, the ability to uh, order uh, foreign uh, incursions uh, and so on. Uh, and so, and in many ways, uh, this would be exactly the, uh, an appropriate time uh, to take the action as opposed to in the middle of a president's term where you do so much damage uh, to a president by invoking uh, the 25th against their will, uh, pol long lasting political damage. Here, uh, what you have is essentially someone who is power is, is coming to a close and uh, official duties are coming to a close. And if indeed, uh, he is suffering from mental incapacity that requires, uh, that shows he's unable to fulfill his duties. And I think the whole episode with the National Guard invocation is some strong evidence, or non-invocation, some strong evidence of that. You know, the vice president and the cabinet members actually have a duty to protect the nation that the 25th Amendment provides uh, to take action, even if it's temporary for a number of days. Um, uh, uh, to protect the nation, if that if they have uh, reached that conclusion, so that that's my comment on that. Uh, as far as crystal ball, I don't really like to be a, a prognosticator. Uh, when we have these kind of spasms of violence, uh, people do often uh, take a step back. Uh, this gathering uh, where you know you could people could get stirred up because they're together in one place. Uh, I don't think they're gonna stay in hotel rooms for 14 days in the, in the nation's capital. Uh, there's gonna be a huge, huge law enforcement presence uh, for the inauguration. Nothing of the, of the sort is going to be tolerated or allowed in Washington DC uh, uh, at the inauguration or prior to it. Um, so no, I, I would not uh, expect uh, anything of the scale that we saw yesterday to uh, happen again. But as I said, I think this is now, uh, unfortunately, uh, a movement and a movement that has a charismatic uh, leader uh, and that can be triggered. And what terrorism is, is a, is a set of people who have deep seated grievances combined with uh, some sort of uh, mobilization factor. And this idea that the uh, election was stolen, that and this, this group's grievance is that they are losing power, that a section of the white majority is, uh, is losing political power. And then here, the grievance, that the most Im imminent grievance is the idea that an election was stolen to take that, that person's alter idol, these people's alter idol, Donald Trump, out of power. So it's a magnification of that very grievance that is motivating the entire white supremacist movement. Uh, so that is a very, very potent powder keg that will continue to, to be out there and then to intersect with what Phil said, uh, can easily be triggered you know, now with social media through tweets and instructions and videos and, and, and the like. So I think we have a, a continuing uh, deep-seated problem that could uh, arise really uh, again, in the future, you know, uh, again, at, at unpredictable times. Sure, thank you. And I, I have one quick follow up on that. To what extent do you think that, that this, this dangerous movement that exists depends on um, President Trump, once he's no longer president, continuing to be vocal and to lead it by encouraging these sorts of things? If, for example, he remains, if he gets permanently banned from social media, if a mouthpiece is taken away, or if by some miracle he goes quiet, do you think that that would um, prompt the, the movement to kind of slowly die out? Does it depend on him? Or do you think there's just this momentum and because of the, the means people have to stay connected through social media, that regardless of what Trump does from now, it continues to snowball? Do you, does your research give you any sense of that? Well, charismatic leadership is an important part of many, many terrorist movements. So you have the shining path uh, in Peru, where once the uh, charismatic leader uh, was removed, uh, Guzman, uh, it, it, it dissipated and fell apart. Then, of course, you have Al-Qaeda, which has persisted despite uh, the uh, termination of, of Osama bin Laden, and its character, charismatic leader. Uh, so there's no script, but I, I think uh, it's very unlikely that the president entirely uh, disappears from the scene. Uh, 
And I think he is a critical, critical element, a motivator, a mobilizer, uh, potentially. Uh, so um, to the extent that he moves away from the scene, he becomes more marginalized, he has less access, uh, that will have an impact. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, I'd remind everybody, uh, we've had lots of great questions and that's, that's great. Uh, you've still got an opportunity to submit some if you would like to in the q and I'm going to move on to another question we've had for you, Professor Napoli. Uh, one of the most remarkable things that we saw yesterday as rioters were inside um, the halls of power is people were taking selfies, taking pictures. Social media clearly seemed to be um, like a part of what this, um, this, this event um, meant to people. So uh, the question we've had there is that um, all this visual documentation that the people themselves were collecting and, and presumably posting on Instagram and Facebook, even though this could obviously um, be used ultimately to charge them with, with crimes, is that something we're, we're seeing more of? What, why is that so important uh, apparently to, to a movement like this? And, and apparently people just um, didn't feel like it was going to come back to bite them and they could do it with impunity. Do you have any take on that? Sure. I, I think, I, you know, to, to, talking about terrorism the way uh, David just was. I mean, I don't think we sh should expect sort of rationality from these folks any more than you expect a, you know, a suicide bomber to think through the consequences of, of, of their actions. Um, that being said though, I think it's also the case that A, uh, a lot of those folks felt like they weren't committing you know, a crime. They, they, they truly, some of them truly believed that they uh, were taking action against an unjust election. Uh, but B, I think that nothing has been clearer over the past four years uh, than a sense that, you know, the, you know, fairly egregious actions uh, haven't had consequences. Um, you know, and, and, and that, that was really borne out yesterday when we watched so many of them just stroll right on out of the, uh, out of the Capitol. And I think even when all is said and done, I doubt we'll be anything close to satisfied uh, with whether the number of people um, get prosecuted that should get prosecuted. Uh, and so unfortunately that's going to really um, fuel the fire going forward, I think, that, um, that there were not the kind of consequences, there will probably won't be the kind of consequences. I hope I turn out to be wrong on this, uh, that there should be for, for actions of this, of this magnitude. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up and I would let the reporters on the call know that we will uh, be sending out some information with quotes from some of our faculty uh, on uh, the apparent treatment of these protesters versus what we saw with some of the Black Lives Matter protesters um, earlier this year. And we have sources that can talk about that too. And you can email us at news um, at uh, dupenews at duke.edu uh, if you want to be included on the list for that. We'll be wrapping up here shortly. Um, but one of the things that, uh, and we, we've touched on this in, in some regards already, um, but Professor Fever, I want to come back to you first on it. Uh, it seems like, you know, that for um, at least segments of the country that respect the rule of law and democracy and, and free and fair elections, that there was some kind of sigh of relief, perhaps when um, President Biden won the election. And of course, we've had an awful lot of disruption since then. Uh, President-elect Biden is supposed to take office in two weeks. Do you think that it is premature or a mistake for people to think that there's any kind of a return to normalcy at that point or to the democratic standards and norms that we expect? Should we expect much as we're talking about with the pandemic, some sort of new normal going forward and that things would, would look very different. Is it a mistake to think that um, everything is still okay in terms of our democratic institutions? Well, I think we have some healing to be uh, done. I, I think as uh, Dean Kelly pointed out, there's a large fraction of Americans uh, who believe that some horrible wrong was done to them and to their party standard bearer. And uh, it's going to take some time for that poison to leach out of the system. Uh, but I, I do think that uh, President-elect Biden has been remarkably sure-footed over the last two months. Um, uh, he ran a, a, a brilliant campaign uh, in the, better than he had done in all of his previous uh, attempts to be president put together. Um, and then since he won, uh, he has been remarkably uh, deft and careful and magnanimous in um, under very extraordinary circumstances. And, and yesterday in the moment uh, gave an, you know, an impromptu, what looked like an unscripted set of remarks that were uh, well pitched to what was needed at the time. He's been presidential and that's what the country had needed yesterday. And we got it from our president elect. So that's, that gives me hope. Uh, 
um, that uh, going forward, he will continue to be presidential. He's assembled a team in the area that I watch most closely, national security, uh, some very, very good appointments uh, and very high caliber people. Um, I'm, I'm a Republican myself, so I'm going to sure disagree with some of the things that they uh, want to do, but it's going to be returned to normal disagreement and normal policy debate, uh, which is, is healthy. Uh, but he is presiding over a very divided party himself. And while he has, won, while the Democrats have won the Senate, it's a razor thin hold. And so that puts a lot of pressure on Biden as a party manager, as the, as the party leader of a, a very factionalized um, party. And so I think he has a, a difficult road ahead and we haven't even mentioned the pandemic, uh, which of course is a, a major crisis that he has to manage uh, out of the gate. Right, uh, and so it's going to be a very challenging time for him, but I think we can draw some encouragement that uh, he's, uh, he's, he's managed the assignments he's had over the last several weeks remarkably well. Thank you. Um, Dean Kelly, I'd like to ask a, a similar question to you. You've talked about the, the light, uh, the beacon flickering, um, but here we are. Do you think that the, the norms that hold our democracy together have survived here? Do you think that there's fundamental change that's needed or is it more of a return to normalcy uh, once Biden takes office, assuming that actually happens? Well, on your question and return to normalcy, you know, as, as Dr. Fever just mentioned uh, about the win by our, uh, the Georgian senators yesterday, and to speak of, speak of a headline that got buried, uh, and that we would have never predicted would have been buried uh, when we got up yesterday morning. Uh, so I think that that um, even as we think about what normal is, certainly what has been normal for quite a while uh, is going to change drastically. And we uh, hopefully will be able to make some progress on, on actually um, on, on policy issues that are important for the nation. We have a lot of important uh, nation uh, issues to tackle. I do think we will withstand this. I do think our, our, our flame will continue to figure it, but maybe we need to turn down the, the, uh, the hubris a little bit and, and uh, examine uh, where we need to make changes. There are a lot of citizens that don't think a return to a normal per se is desirable. Uh, a large portion of our population has been in the streets for the last year saying that normal is not good enough and that we need to, uh, we need to uh, have a, a much broader conversation as a society, not just about Black Lives Matter, obviously this is a, a really important on the agenda, but also uh, on, on the full spectrum of where citizens are at and the, and the suffering and the, uh, the pain that they're going through, not just in connection with the pandemic, but also why are so many voters uh, 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 susceptible to the type of rhetoric that that Trump has promoted um, because he has been able to play in to real suffering also uh, in, in different different segments of the population. So we have a lot of healing to do uh, and hopefully it will be an opening for a, a much, much broader conversation about how we move forward as a society. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, we're almost at time here, but um, Professor Napoli, I wanted to come back to the, the point we made at the beginning. Of course, social media and the media barrel ahead regardless of elections. But again, how huge is it, do you think, that Facebook suspended uh, President Trump before, um, you know, for the, for the remainder of his time in office? Do you think that that signals a fundamental change in the way that social media and then perhaps even partisan media outlets are, are going to um, act from now on? Or is it just more of this uh, business as usual that we've seen? Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't treat that response as indicative of, uh, you know, I, would, I wouldn't want to lump all of our social media or news media together in any way, shape or form in terms of anticipating what's going to happen going forward. Um, uh, President Trump can get banned from Twitter and Facebook and YouTube, and he can have free reign then on Parler. Um, you know, legitimate news outlets can, you know, cut away from news conferences and speeches and rallies when he starts to spew disinformation, but that doesn't mean uh, that OAN and, and Newsmax and Fox won't just continue to uh, give him a platform. I mean, the reality is uh, he'll probably end up with his own show or his own network um, after the election. Um, so we have a, a massive systemic problem. I mean, certainly what Facebook has done uh, is, is helpful. Um, 
And it would be nice if that becomes something closer to the norm. Um, but this is a space that's starting to, uh, to fragment. There's, there are a lot of platforms out there uh, and, you know, and the audience, you know, the audience will follow him is, is uh, you know, not all of them, but, but, but plenty will. Sure, thank you. And um, Professor Shanza, you know, we saw lots of comments yesterday um, as the images unfolded of people hoping that this was rock bottom and other people suggesting that it was just a step on the way to the bottom. Ultimately, as we look at the next two weeks and then the years beyond, are you uh, more hopeful or more pessimistic? And I realize there are a lot of layers that play into that. But um, where is your mindset as you look forward to 2021 and beyond? Well, I'm certainly looking forward to the president-elect becoming the president because he's a, a, my personal experience is that he is truly a decent, warm, uh, caring person. And I think we need a little more love in our uh, social discourse. And I think that this is, it is, it is the moment it, that he was designed uh, to, to take this office. And I think he will bring uh, that tone uh, to the most important office, I still think, in, in the world. And, um, and that matters. Those things matter. We've, we've just had so much hand and divisiveness and sniping and just uh, bad character uh, coming from the office of the president. And, and, and Biden ran. His whole premise of his campaign was a return to both normalcy, as you've mentioned, but also to decency. And I think if we can uh, and then and recovering from this pandemic uh, requires that uh, as well. And everybody who's lived through it uh, understands that. So uh, some more caring and decency and kindness, I think it's gonna go a long way to, to changing the future and, and some vaccinations uh, uh, yeah. as well uh, uh, would be nice. And you know, if, uh, if we can speed the vaccination program uh, we can stop the, this horrible uh, pandemic. We can return to uh, some normal life, and we can then hopefully revitalize our economy. Boy, that's a that's a you know if that can happen in a year, that's a great thing for the country to build on and move from there. So Absolutely. Let's end this uh, on a on an optimistic note, if possible. Yeah, absolutely. I can't think of a better place to leave it than love, kindness, decency, and vaccinations. Uh, that's what we can take from this. So we'll leave it there. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you to our panelists, Judith Kelly, Peter Fever, Phil Napoli, and David Shanza for sharing your perspectives. We are holding regular briefings on the transition of power, the pandemic, and whatever else comes up in this crazy year so far. If you'd like to be on the list for future briefings, please email dukenews at duke.edu to let us know. In the meantime, please stay well, uh, wear a mask, and get vaccinated when it's your turn. Take care, everyone.